Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is David Holtzman, and I'm pleased to be giving uh, the plenary lecture for the American um, Academy of Sleep Medicine and the Sleep Research Society. It's an honor to be uh, nominated and to give this lectureship. Um, today, I'm going to talk about sleep and Alzheimer's disease, a bi-directional relationship with amyloid, beta, and tau. And I think one of the things I wanted to point out right at the beginning um, as I tell you about work that we've done in my laboratory over the last 15 years or so, um, is to always uh, keep your eyes open uh, when you're doing research and don't be afraid to follow up uh, what you weren't necessarily expecting to find, because that's ultimately what led uh, me to study uh, sleep. Before I get started, um, I list here my disclosures. Um, they are not directly related to the work I'm going to show today. So uh, because I'm gonna talk about Alzheimer's disease, the first thing I wanted to do is provide a background about Alzheimer's disease and its relationship in neuronal activity and metabolism. Um, and then uh, move into how that uh, studying that phenomenon uh, led us to look at the relationship between sleep and two of the other major proteins and two of the major proteins involved in Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis, amyloid beta and tau. So to make sure everybody's on the same page, uh, dementia means a decline in memory and other cognitive abilities that is sufficient to impair social and occupational functioning. And uh, there are many, many different diseases that cause dementia. Alzheimer's disease uh, uh, is the major contributor in the United States to dementia, uh, probably contributing to about 70% of people who become demented. The prevalence of uh, dementia is about 2% at age 70, but after the age of 85, it, it approaches 50%. Um, and this is one of the main reasons so many people are interested in developing uh, therapies to either prevent uh, or treat Alzheimer's disease. It's currently uh, believed to be the most expensive uh, disease in the United States because of the care that's required to uh, take uh, uh, for people with this problem. So the typical clinical features of Alzheimer's disease is that there's a very gradual onset and progression, usually over six to 12 months, where um, a family member friend uh, notices that uh, a person's developing trouble with recent or episodic memory. Um, that's not always the first symptom of the disease, it's, but it's the most frequent first symptom. Um, as a disease, uh, progresses and even often right near the beginning, there's often also difficulty with problem solving and attention. Um, and then as the disease moves along, other parts of the brain begin to become impaired and people develop difficulties with language, praxis and visual spatial dysfunction. Behavioral abnormalities um, are frequent early on, most common being apathy, um, but other changes such as delusions and hallucinations can occur, especially as people move into the more moderate to severe stages of disease. And as we'll talk about today, sleep disruption is also an important feature of the disease. There are two major types of Alzheimer's disease, autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, which is less than 1% of, of cases, but has taught us a lot about the pathophysiology of the, of the disorder. And then late onset Alzheimer's disease or load, which is when people develop dementia from Alzheimer's disease after the age of 60. And this is 99% of what we see clinically. Even in late onset Alzheimer's disease, however, in addition to age being uh, one of the biggest risk factors, genetics uh, is also very important. And in fact, of all the common diseases in humans, um, late onset Alzheimer's disease is probably the strongest uh, genetic uh, disease of, of these compared to, for example, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. This is a, a model of the microscopic brain pathology that one sees in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so as first described by Awa Alzheimer uh, in the early 1900s and colleagues, what you can see is the uh, accumulation in the extracellular space of the brain of this small peptide called amyloid beta. Um, this, this peptide is a normal product uh, of metabolism of the amyloid precursor protein, which is highly enriched in neurons and their processes. Uh, 
Um, normally, this monomer is produced and cleared rapidly, and it's not known to have a normal function, unlike the precursor protein from which it's derived, which probably does play a role in synaptic plasticity and possibly neurotransmission. So the amyloid beta peptide, because it's amyloidogenic, at high, uh, because of its concentration or other binding factors, can deposit in, in the brain as an amyloid protein. The other major protein that aggregates in Alzheimer's disease and accumulates is, is tau, which is a microtubule associated protein um, that's present normally in axons, but when it aggregates and becomes hyperphosphorylated in Alzheimer's disease, it forms neurofibrillary tangles inside of cells, um, both in cell bodies and, and in the dendrites. In addition to these protein accumulations, there's a strong inflammatory response with, ast with a, a astrocyte activation, um, as well as, importantly, microglial activation. Um, and I, while I won't talk a lot about this today, uh, emerging evidence suggests that microglia are very important um, in the pathogenesis of the disease. In fact, several of the new genetic risk factors that have been discovered are only expressed in the brain in microglia. So one of the important um, uh, pathological features of Alzheimer's disease that in terms of the time course uh, of the clinical uh, manifestations <clears throat> is that it's been determined over the last 30 years that if somebody develops the earliest clinical symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, sometimes called very mild dementia or mild cognitive impairment, if a, person, uh, if a person's brain was examined at that time and their underlying abnormal cognitive abnormalities are due to Alzheimer's disease pathology, that is not the beginning of the disease. It's actually at least 20 years into the course of the disease. So what we now know is that the amyloid beta peptide and amyloid plaques begins to accumulate in the cortex beginning about 20 years before its symptom onset, and it slowly accumulates over time. And as this occurs, as, as uh, by a few years before symptom onset, neurofibrillary tangles begin to uh, aggregate and deposit in the cortex. And it is this deposition that is linked closely with the clinical abnormalities that we see in patients. So this is important because if we're going to study the pathophysiology of the disease, we want to understand what's leading to this initial formation of protein aggregation, both either of A beta or tau, or some of the processes that regulate uh, those factors. So this is a complicated slide, and I'll make it simple in the next slide, where um, initially it was hypothesized uh, that the amyloid beta peptide which again, as I told you earlier, is formed from the amyloid precursor protein shown here, somehow aggregates and drives the disease. And while that may be uh, true to some extent, I think a, a more accurate way of describing what's been learned about these proteins is that the aggregation of the A-beta peptide is necessary for Alzheimer's disease, but it's not sufficient. In order for the A-beta aggregation to ultimately uh, lead to Alzheimer's disease, other things need to happen. In particular, it needs to somehow drive the accumulation and the spread of the tau aggregated form of the tau protein in the neocortex. And as, as part of this process, inflammation plays an, a key role in regulating both A beta and its damage to the brain, and, but in, also how A beta drives tauopathy and how tauopathy drives damage. It turns out though that there are a lot of factors that regulate either a beta aggregation, tau aggregation, and neurodegeneration that are all listed on the edges of this cascade. And so what I'm gonna focus on next is, if this is a linear version of the amyloid cascade hypothesis, where is it that some of the other physiologic factors such as brain metabolism might play into this uh, model? And uh, what I'll show you next is evidence that synaptic activity itself actually regulates the production of the A-beta peptide from the amyloid precursor protein, and that this, this regulation is probably something that plays an important role in whether and when the A-beta peptide aggregates in the brain. And then I'll talk next about how sleep, the sleep-wake cycle appears to regulate um, not only synaptic activity, but this process. So 
Um, after the advent of uh, the ability to image the amyloid beta protein aggregates in the brain with what's called amyloid imaging, in, uh, different investigators began to study in cognitively normal people the initial onset of amyloid beta deposition in the brain. And in these studies by uh, Randy Buckner, Mark Rakel, and colleagues at Washington University, what they started to see is that, and as well as Mark Minton, you can see that the amyloid beta peptide here shown in red that's aggregated in the human brain first deposits in areas of the brain shown here in the medial frontal cortex, the posterior cingulate, lateral temporal, and frontal parts of the frontal lobe. And when they started to see this pattern of aggregation, it immediately uh, came to their mind that this seems to overlap to a great extent with a network in the brain called the default mode network. So this is a network that tends to be turned on the most when people are not performing a specific cognitive task. So it turns out this is one of the most metabolically active networks in the brain over a 24 hour period in humans. And so one question is, well, why is it that this pattern of aggregation um, overlaps with the default mode network like this? So one, uh, possibility is that perhaps neuronal and synaptic activity are the highest over a 24-hour period in this network. And maybe that's somehow linked with driving the production of the amyloid beta peptide. So in a series of studies first carried out in vitro where I, by Roberto Malinau's lab at Cold Spring Harbor at that time, as well as my lab by John Cerrito, a graduate student and postdoc, what we went on to show in a series of studies is that Normally, when synaptic vesicles are at the synapse and they're released, it's known that they're rapidly re-endocytosed into the cell for recycling. And the amyloid precursor protein from which the A-beta peptide is derived is also highly enriched in the synapse. And what we ended up showing is that the greater the amount of synaptic activity, that leads to enhanced recycling of the amyloid precursor protein into endosomes. And it is there that the enzymes that cleave amyloid beta from APP called beta secretase and gamma secretase are present, leading to an increase in A beta release. There are also mechanisms that when postsynaptic activity is activated that the interstitial fluid levels in the brain of the amyloid peptide are also increased due to increased release. So this is, this is work that we had been doing in an ongoing fashion between around 2003 to 2008. And it is around that time that we also began to explore what physiologically regulates the level of the A-beta peptide and its release in the brain. And one of the things that we found, and these studies were led by another graduate student, Adam Biro, is that endogenous levels of the amyloid beta peptide in the brain correlate with regional neuronal activity and if you do the experiments in an animal that's going to develop amyloid deposition, these regional levels of activity and, those, and the A-beta levels that are in those regions predict subsequently the amount of amyloid deposition that will occur in those regions. So that, again, further argued that it's the level of the secreted form of A-beta that will likely determine uh, whether over time it's going to aggregate in the brain. And to further get at this point, by simply manipulating physiologic levels of neuronal activity, in this case in the mouse, we were able to show that if you uh, manipulate the whiskers uh, of a mouse uh, and you look at the barrel system, which is the sensory part of the cortex subserving the whiskers, that that acutely affects the interstitial fluid level of amyloid beta in the brain. So if you stimulated the whiskers, the level went higher. If you cut the whiskers, the level went lower. And if you did this chronically over time, that actually over months affected the amount of amyloid deposition in that part of the brain. So, so with this background um, uh, that we began to sort of stumble into the fact that perhaps sleep itself might regulate the levels of this peptide. So Jay and Kong, a very talented graduate student at the time, was exploring other ways that uh, normal physiologic manipulations might affect um, the levels of the amyloid beta peptide. And one of the things she was studying was stress, and she found that acute stress altered the level of A-beta through, again, affecting neuronal activity. Uh, but when she was monitoring the levels of the A-beta peptide over time spontaneously, she began to observe 
that the A beta peptide was highest in, in the mouse brain, and this is in this case measured in the hippocampus, highest during the dark when animal when mice, which are diurnal, uh, are nocturnal, uh, have uh, more are more awake. And it was lower during the light when they are sleeping more. And you can see it just went up and down with the sleep-wake cycle, higher during wakefulness, lower during sleep. And the amount of wakefulness correlated with the levels of the A-beta peptide. Uh, around the same time, my, uh, we began to collaborate with my colleague, Randy Bateman, who had been studying um, CSF, cerebrospinal fluid levels, of different proteins uh, in humans. And he had developed a technique where uh, we would put in lumbar catheters into humans where we could sample kind of like an intravenous line um, levels of proteins in CSF over a 36 hour period. And in doing this, what we also observed in humans is that the pep A beta peptide also was higher uh, during wakefulness and lower during sleep. And very similar to what we were seeing in the mouse brain. So um, Adam Biro had replicated the studies of Jayun Kong in our lab, where we found again that A beta peptide is higher during the dark when animals are more awake and lower during the light when they're sleeping more. But interestingly, one of the things that strongly correlated with the levels of the A beta peptide was the levels in the interstitial fluid of the brain of lactate. And here you can see that lactate levels are about 35% higher during the dark phase when animals are more awake than during sleep. And in fact, when an animal goes from sleep to wake, if you monitor the levels of lactate just by the second with electrochemical probes, you can see that lactate will change within a second or two of an animal going from sleep to wake, indicating um, a significant change in neuronal metabolism that occurs uh, going from sleep to wake. Now, in vitro studies have shown that when synaptic activity occurs, that drives the production of lactate uh, through an, probably through an astrocyte uh, neuron uh, psych, uh, uh, connection. So I think this argues that uh, there is a strong change in neuronal metabolism that occurs when an animal goes to from sleep to wake or vice versa and that that is directly linked with the levels of the amyloid beta peptide. So when we first started making these observations of how the sleep-wake cycle was regulating um, or was linked with A beta peptide levels, we also, we wanted to try to determine was it sleep and wake that was doing this or was it some other, other, um, other things such as circadian changes? So um, in these experiments, Jayun was doing microdialysis to measure the A-beta peptide in the interstitial fluid. And again, you could see that the A-beta peptide was lower during when animals were sleeping more, higher when they were awake more. But when they, when they were going to sleep more, she did an infusion of orexin, the awake promoting neuropeptide. And instead of the A-beta peptide going down during sleep, it remained elevated, concomitant with increased wakefulness. Conversely, when she did the opposite experiment, so at the beginning of the dark phase when the animal should be um, awake more and the A-beta peptide would normally go up, she gave almorexant, the dual orexin receptor antagonist, that prevented this increase in A-beta peptide. So arguing that a wake-promoting uh, uh, manipulation or sleep-promoting manipulation uh, was manipulating the A-beta peptide acutely in the extracellular space of the brain. So one of the uh, things we, we wanted to know after we saw these acute manipulations of the monomeric form of the A-beta peptide that's produced all the time is if you do these manipulations to the sleep-wake cycle, what does that uh, mean chronically for the animal? And so in these experiments, Miranda Lim, who was then a, a, a neurology resident at Washington University, uh, spent some time doing research in my lab and she did, uh, took amyloid uh, precursor protein uh, uh, mice, which develop amyloid plaques, just as is seen in the human brain. And she uh, did an experiment where she either sleep-restricted animals or she did not by having a, a controls. Uh, 
And um, she did this right at the time when the animal was about to develop amyloid deposition and did this for a four to six week period. Then the animals were sacrificed and we looked at the amyloid pathology in the brain. And what you can see on the right here is that the animals that were sleep deprived had significantly more amyloid deposition in the brain than those that were not. And in fact, the amyloid deposition was increased in all areas of the brain that we examined, and it was increased by about two and a half fold versus the controls. She then did the converse experiment and uh, orally gavaged the same animals at the same kind of time points, Almorexan, a dual orexin receptor antagonist, for uh, four weeks and then examine the amount of amyloid deposition that occurred. And you can see uh, uh, in opposite of what occurred with sleep restriction, the promotion of sleep associated with almorexant resulted in a strong decrease in amyloid deposition. So I think in aggregate, these findings suggested that these manipulations to sleep acutely affect the amyloid beta peptide in its monomeric form and then chronically perhaps through altering the levels of the, of the monomer, it altered the likelihood that the peptide would aggregate and form amyloid plaques in the brain. So the experiments that I just showed you all um, were demonstrating that the acute manipulations of neuronal and synaptic activity through affecting A beta release from neurons and synapses was, a, was resulting in the findings I showed you. A few years after this, the work of Macon Niedergaard, she, she had been studying how fluid flow in the brain was regulated by astrocytes and water channels um, and uh, came up with the term glymphatic system to describe how a, a glia uh, and water channels manipulate fluid flow from um, arteries to venules in the brain in the extracellular space of the brain. And when her group found this, she began to explore whether that system affected clearance of proteins from the extracellular space. And in this study, there, her lab found that if she injected protein like amyloid beta peptide into the brain of animals, that when the animals were awake here in orange, that the clearance of the peptide was slower from the brain than in controls. So this um, finding led to the idea that perhaps this lymphatic system was regulating the clearance of metabolites from the extracellular space, including a beta. Um, and that, that may be true. I would say the studies that we have done that I just showed you, as well as subsequent studies I'll show you uh, sub, uh, later in this talk, argue that the effects that we're seeing on proteins like a beta and later tau are not due to effects on lymphatic clearance. They're actually due to effects on the release alterations in the release and production of these proteins from synaptic localization. But we can talk about that more as we go along. So given that sleep disruption and sleep promotion in mice acutely influences amyloid beta levels, we wanted to further assess whether this occurs in human beings. So these are studies now I'm showing you that were led by Brendan Lucy together with Randy Bateman. And uh, Brendan recruited uh, adult healthy volunteers, um, 18 to 60 years old, and uh, did lumbar catheter studies in these individuals. And uh, they uh, had uh, lumbar catheters placed, and then uh, they actually had sleep studies uh, overnight. And um, the participants were in the study were either behaviorally sleep deprived or not. Um, and then CSF was sampled every two hours for a 36 hour period. So if you focus on these top panels and you compare the red lines to the blue and green lines, what you can see is that Brendan uh, was measuring the A beta peptide by mass spectrometry in the CSF of these individuals. And you can see that the individuals that were sleep deprived in red had higher levels of different forms of the A beta peptide than those who are not sleep deprived. You can see that the level was actually increased by about 35 to 40% um, due to sleep deprivation. And um, he also uh, metabolically labeled these individuals so that you could measure the production and the clearance of the A beta peptide in addition to measuring the absolute levels. And what you can see is that the production and clearance um, as, as, as shown in these curves was not different. And that's consistent with the fact that if you have an increased rate of production, these curves won't change. 
But if you had a change in the clearance, the curves will change. So this strongly argues that sleep deprivation increases the A-beta peptide in human cerebrospinal fluid, likely ref reflecting uh, a different production in the brain um, that, that is resulting in this change. Um, one of the questions that Yoel Ju, um, also a faculty member at Washington University, began to ask is, is it specifically slow wave sleep disruption that accounts for these changes in the A-beta peptide? So Yoel and colleagues came up with a method to specifically modulate slow wave sleep. And in this study, um, she measured the A-beta peptide in the morning in, in human beings that had either been had their slow wave sleep altered or not. And what you can see is that there is a, a significant correlation with the decrease in delta power and an increase in A-beta levels in CSF. So again, suggesting that it's not just sleep disruption that alters uh, A-beta levels, it's actually specifically disrupting slow wave sleep. So, with all of these acute changes that I was just showing you, one of the other questions is once you develop amyloid deposition in the brain, is that associated with and actually causing abnormalities in the sleep-wake cycle? So these are studies now in animals that were done by Jihun Ro, a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. And what he did was he looked at these amyloid prote precursor protein transgenic mice and you can see at different time points in their life, at three months, there's no amyloid deposition, six months, there's some. And by nine months in the hippocampus, there's a fair amount of amyloid deposition. And this is compared to a wild type mouse that does not develop this pathology. So he studied sleep um, abnormalities that, and determined whether they occur in these animals in a time dependent fashion. So what you can see is if you focus on the light phase when the animals typically are, are, are awake uh, less is that at three months of age, mice are awake about 20 minutes uh, per hour, which is pretty normal. You, this would be normal for a, a mouse. But as the mice develop amyloid pathology, they have increasing amount of wakefulness during the light phase. In fact, it increases by uh, uh, 50 percent from 20 minutes to over 30 minutes. So the question is, is this due to amyloid deposition or some other change that's occurring in the mice? So in order to address that specifically, we um, vaccinated the mice with A-beta-42 subcutaneously. And it, this is known if you do this to where the mice will develop antibodies to amyloid and result in clearing the amyloid from the brain. So this on the bottom left is a PBS and vaccinated animal that develops a lot of amyloid deposition by nine months of age. And the animals that were vaccinated developed almost no amyloid deposition. So the, in this experiment, these animals were then assessed in regard to their sleep-wake uh, cycle um, uh, at, at nine months of age. When we did this, we looked at many different things, but what's shown here is the amount of minutes awake per hour. So in the PBS vaccinated mice, which have a lot of amyloid deposition, you can see during the light phase that they're awake more than half the time, which is very abnormal. However, and the A-beta vaccinated mice, which again, as I just showed you, have almost no amyloid deposition, they have uh, normal amounts of wakefulness, about 20 minutes or so during the light phase. So this strongly argues that the abnormalities in sleep observed in this model of increased wakefulness is mediated directly by amyloid deposition. So what evidence in humans is there that amyloid deposition may actually lead to disruptions in sleep and non-REM slow waves, even prior to cognitive decline? So as I showed you at the beginning of the talk, amyloid deposition begins to accumulate beginning about 20 years before the onset of, of dementia from Alzheimer's disease, and, and then accumulates gradually over time. And so in a series of studies, one of them led by Yoel Ju, one by Adam Spira, and another one uh, by Bryce Mander uh, uh, at Berkeley with Matt Walker. Um, what these studies show is that during the preclinical phase of Alzheimer's disease, when amyloid deposition is occurring, there are abnormalities of sleep that were defined. In this case, you will find an abnormality of sleep quality that correlated with amyloid deposition. Um, in, at Adam's work, uh, 
He looked at self-reported sleep abnormalities and showed there were more of them in, in people that deposited amyloid. And in this work from uh, Bryce Mander and Matt Walker, they found that non-REM slow waves were related to hippocampal dependent memory uh, abnormalities, and that was correlated with amyloid deposition. So what I've showed you so far is, the, is a relationship, a bidirectional relationship between sleep and amyloid beta. What I wanted to now focus on is the relationship between sleep and the tau protein. So as I showed you earlier, the deposition of amyloid plaques begins to occur in the brain about 20 years before the onset of symptoms due to Alzheimer's disease. However, it is actually the accumulation of hyperphosphorylated aggregated tau in parts of the neocortex that strongly relates to damage in the brain as well as the cognitive abnormalities that we see clinically. And these changes begin to occur just before the onset of cognitive decline. Shown in another way, this is data from the dominantly inherited Alzheimer's network that studies people with autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease. And you see a very similar time course of amyloid deposition. Um, and then here's the cognitive decline beginning at time zero. And in this population, what's recently been found is that tau pathology does not occur until just before symptom onset in this group of individuals, just like I showed you in late onset Alzheimer's disease. In, in other studies in late onset Alzheimer's disease, the, in work by Keith Johnson and Risa Sperling from their lab at MGH, what you can see is that if you look at these cognitively normal people in B and C, they have amyloid deposition, but as shown in this tau PET scan, they have very little cortical tau pathology. But what coincides with the onset of dementia and, ab and clinical abnormalities is the accumulation of this purple in the neocortex, which represents tau accumulation in different parts of the brain. And in this study by Gil Rabinovich, just published at UCSF, they found if you look at tau pathology in the brain and then try to see what happens subsequently, you can see that the baseline amount of tau is what predicts longitudinal brain atrophy, but not amyloid beta, which is already accumulated in the brain pretty much to its maximal extent by the time people are symptomatic. So I'm just showing you all this to show you the importance of tau accumulation and the actual damage that occurs in the brain, both in Alzheimer's disease and also what I'm not showing here, primary tauopathies. So given this, one of the things that we also began to study a few years ago is what regulates tau in the brain. And uh, one of the things about tau is that once it is present and, and aggregated inside the cell in the brain, it tends to spread from one brain area to another. And there's a lot of data suggesting that it's the release of tau into the extracellular space which regulates that spreading process. So we began to study what regulates tau release. And in these straightforward experiments that were done by Keoro Yamada in my lab, she used microdialysis to measure the level of tau in the extracellular space of wild type mice. And that is shown here in the bottom where we're giving by reverse microdialysis, high potassium to stimulate neuronal activity. When you give high potassium, glucose goes down due to increased neuronal activity, lactate goes up. And in a slow time course, there is an increase in extracellular tau by two to three fold over several hours. This is also found when you stimulate neuronal activity with NMDA, a glutamate uh, um, uh, to mimic the effects of uh, glutamate on NMDA receptors, you can see that this while it's the amount of NMGA we're giving increases activity, it's not enough to cause seizures and it elevates extracellular tau by two to three fold. So one question is, well, okay, that is there are acute studies. What if you stimulate the brain so that it has extra synaptic activity over a month or so? And these studies carried out in Karen Duff's lab at Columbia University showed that if you stimulate a brain that's susceptible to developing tau tangles, uh, excessively for a month, they develop an increase in tau seeding and tau tangles on the side of the brain that's stimulated, in this case, with an optogenetic method. So it's with that background, we began to apply some of the same methods that we use to study the relationship between sleep and amyloid beta to sleep and tau. And in this experiment, these experiments were done by Jarrah Holth and Sarah Frischi in my lab. And I'll first take you through the top panel A. And what we asked in this experiment is we we're studying wild type mice 
a microdialysis catheter was placed in the, in the hippocampus, and then sleep-wake studies were performed. Um, so you can see here in the black, black circles are animals where the tau levels are measured during the light phase when the animals are sleeping more, and then during the dark phase when they're awake more. And you can see that like amyloid beta, tau is increased in animals when they're awake more. In fact, the increase in tau that occurs during wakefulness is more than twofold. This is higher than what we see with the change in amyloid beta with the sleep-wake cycle. We then, Jera then did experiments to manually sleep deprive the animals, and you can see that that more than doubled the level of interstitial fluid tau by just subtly uh, keep, just keeping the animals awake um, when they should be asleep more. What she also found in the blue uh, circles is that if you blocked neuronal activity in these animals with tetrodotoxin being given locally in the brain, you can see that that completely blocked all of these increases in tau that occurred with sleep deprivation. We then went on to collaborate with Brendan Lucy, who had collected um, CSF samples, as, as I showed you earlier, from individuals that were um, had a normal night of sleep. Uh, who had a lumbar catheter samples that were assessed, or they had sleep deprivation. And you can see, just like with amyloid beta, that tau is increased, in this case, about 40 to 50% in human cerebrospinal fluid with sleep deprivation. Other proteins involved in neurodegeneration, such as alpha-synucleus, alpha-synuclein, were also significantly increased. And the change in tau, uh, the different levels of tau, are actually tightly linked with the levels of amyloid beta. And, and these experiments strongly suggest that something about these proteins is, uh, and, and sleep deprivation are linked together. And I think a clue to this is that if you look at other proteins shown here in cerebrospinal fluid that are released from the cell, in this case, neurofilament light chain, or this astrocyte protein, GFAP, these proteins are not changed at all by sleep deprivation. So what's the difference between the proteins that do change versus those that don't? These proteins are all cytoplasmic proteins, uh, uh, in this case, neuronal cytoplasm, or in this case, astrocyte cytoplasm. The, the amyloid beta uh, protein, tau protein, and synuclein actually are, while they're inside, um, they're produced inside neurons, they are, they are strongly enriched at the synapse. So the hypothesis is that these proteins that are increased in CSF or in the mouse interstitial fluid of the brain by sleep deprivation are actually being released be with, with increased synaptic activity that's occurring during uh, uh, wakefulness. So just like we did with amyloid beta, we wanted to know if you chronically affected sleep, would that affect tau pathology? So in order to uh, develop a model of this, uh, we use a model that had been used previously by Virginia Lee's lab where if you take a, a mouse that's susceptible to getting tau tangles early in life and you seed them with recombinant tau in the brain, they develop tau tangles. Um, in, in this case, we injected these uh, tangle, the recombinant tau pathology into the hippocampus. And you can see with this antibody stain to ATA to hyperphosphorylated tau epitope that you can see that there's tau pathology a month later. Um, and in these animals, we either uh, sleep deprived the animals for one month or they were not sleep deprived. And you can see that the tau seeding that occurred locally was about the same. However, if you look at areas where these uh, brain regions project, where tau pathology has been shown to spread to, you can see that if you look, for example, in the locus ceruleus, in the animals that were sleep deprived, there's a, a more than about a twofold increase in tau spreading from the seeded area to the spreaded area and the animals that were sleep deprived. And we also found that in other areas that were connected to the hippocampus, there was an increase in tau spreading. So um, I think this was strong evidence that um, sleep manipulation affected um, tau acutely and chronically. But one of the things that we wanted to assess, and this was work led by Sarah Frischi, um, is whether or not it's truly manipulations of sleep versus other factors such as stress that were affecting A beta and tau levels. And so um, we decided to explore a technique uh, to manipulate some of the sleep-wake nuclei in the brain 
uh, directly uh, to see if that would cause some of the same effects I was just showing you. And so in order to do this, um, we began a collaboration uh, with Nigel Peterson, Patrick Fuller, uh, and Cliff Saper, where we began to use a chemogenetic technique that they had described using uh, dreads. And uh, to do this, um, you take a channel, you express a channel, in this case, M3DQ, which can be activated selectively uh, uh, by, by drugs that only activate uh, these channels and not endogenous uh, channels in the brain. These are mutant human muscarinogastocholine receptors. And in the case, what we did in these experiments, we used the drug clozapine anoxide, which at the doses we used um, activates these receptors, but, but doesn't have other effects. So the technique that had been developed by Nigel Peterson and Patrick Fuller's lab um, is that when they uh, expressed these this channel M3DQ in a region of the brain called the supramammillary nucleus, if they express this channel only in glutamatergic neurons in this region by using a particular uh, type of animal that you can uh, express this channel only in glutamatergic neurons in this region by giving them and then give them CNO, it will activate those neurons. And what they had shown is if you do this, this causes the animal to go from uh, a normal sleep-wake cycle to being a, a completely awake for several hours in a row. So we learned, Sarah learned this technique um, and then applied it to study the effects of manipulating, uh, of uh, chemogenetically manipulating this region on a beta and tau. So this, this is showing that if you in, um, inject using a, a viral method, um, this channel in this region, this is the localization of the channel. Um, and if you uh, do this in animals in which uh, they're expressing Cre, which flips the channel into the proper expression position, then when you give them C, uh, the drug CNO, uh, in this case, normal animals are more um, uh, are sleeping more during the light and awake more during the dark. But when you give the CNO, just as uh, uh, Nigel Peterson had shown with Patrick Fuller, these animals are almost 100% awake for several hours in a row. So that mimics what they had seen. And if you give a, a saline, this effect is not present. We then looked at the proteins we'd been studying, amyloid beta and tau. And what you can see is that when you cause sudden wakefulness with CNO, A beta peptide goes up about 40% over several hours. Um, and this corresponds with a change in lactate, which we had seen previously using behavioral manipulations. We then also looked in wild type mice at the same chemogenetic activation of wakefulness on tau levels. And uh, uh, just like we had seen with behavioral manipulations, this also CNO caused increased wakefulness or uh, almost complete wakefulness and tau levels went up about 60, 70%. The time course of tau changes is slower than that for A beta indicating a potentially different mechanism of tau release. Um, but this is very similar to what we saw with behavioral manipulation. So finally, um, we wanted to also understand the potential relationship with tau pathology and how it might be influencing sleep itself. So in these studies carried out by Brendan Lucy, um, we studied a group of individuals that are followed at our Washington University Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, most of whom are cognitively normal. You can see CDR is zero, that 75% of these people are cognitively normal. And some of them, about 20, 20 to 25%, have a very mild uh, cognitive impairment. And um, we studied uh, the sleep-wake cycle using um, ambulatory EEG in these individuals over a week. And all of them had uh, assessments of amyloid and tau pathology, either by PET imaging or by CSF. And the main findings that came from this is that if you there was a significant relationship between a decrease in slow wave uh, power that occurred that was related to the amount of tau pathology in the brain. And, and you can see here with the one to two hertz uh, uh, slow wave association, this was also significant. Um, and in fact, 
Uh, these are the regions of the brain where tau pathology is associated with this decrease in slow wave power. Um, if we compare this to the change in slow wave power that's associated with amyloid deposition, there was actually um, almost but not significant change associated with amyloid deposition here. And we when we corrected for a number of other factors, actually, this association was no longer present, indicating that while amyloid deposition may be in some way related to these changes, it's more likely that tau is driving this to a greater extent. So I think in sum, um, what these studies are arguing is that um, when, when individuals for a variety of reasons might have abnormal or fragmented sleep over a long period of time, this leads to excessive amyloid release, earlier onset of amyloid deposition. This may itself uh, affect uh, sleep. Um, and that this process is also relevant for release of the tau protein, tau pathology, and damage in the brain. So in summary, sleep weight changes in endogenous neuronal activity and metabolism appears to regulate interstitial fluid levels in the brain of amyloid beta and tau, and that this ultimately determines the likelihood of whether these proteins aggregate in the brain. I think our data also suggests that with stimulation of a wake center, that these effects are via influencing the sleep-wake cycle and not via other linked mechanisms such as stress. And further, A beta and tau aggregation may lead to sleep disruption, and that this may occur during the stage of preclinical Alzheimer's disease. So what are some future questions that we and others, I think, are trying to now address? So one of the things that we've become interested in recently is do other genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, such as APOE genotype, the strongest genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's, influence the effect of sleep on AD pathogenesis? And if so, how does this work? Another issue is what, what intracellular pathway enables the release of monomeric and other forms of tau from the cell? And how do differences in neuronal metabolism that occur during wake and sleep influence this process? One, a, a third issue that we're trying to understand is are midlife sleep disorders associated with earlier onset of A beta tau and synuclein aggregation in the human brain? And ultimately, does that put one at higher risk for diseases associated, associated with aggregation of these proteins? We certainly have evidence for this in animal models, but um, we're, we don't yet have direct evidence for this in humans. I think this is gonna be an important thing to sort out. And given the data that tau pathology and CSF levels of A beta 40, tau and A beta 42, which are reflective of amyloid and tau pathology, Given that these are related to quantitative changes in slow wave activity during non-REM sleep, can these changes actually be utilized as biomarkers in humans that predict prognosis and that would respond to treatments? And finally, probably perhaps the most important question is can one manipulate sleep and wake as a treatment or prevention for diseases like Alzheimer's disease? I think this is an exciting thing to further explore. With that, I will. I, I tried to thank many people responsible for this work uh, along the way, uh, but in particular, I want to re-mention John Cerrito, who discovered some of the relationships between synaptic activity and A beta release. Jayun Kung, who um, showed the initial association between the sleep-wake cycle and A beta, and Miranda Lim, who worked with her to look at the effects of chronic deprivation. Ji Hoon Ro who did many of the experiments looking at the effects of A-beta on sleep. Um, and Jared Holt and Sarah Frischi, who did a lot of work um, looking at the chemogenetic manipulation of, of sleep on A-beta and tau. And both Brendan Lucy and Yoel Ju, who've been leading uh, very important studies in humans, looking at how these relationships might bear out in the human brain. And then also collaborators at, at uh, uh, Beth Israel at Harvard, Nigel Peterson, uh, and Patrick Fuller and others. Um, so thanks very much for uh, listening to this talk.